right, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today we're going to be talking about insurance, more specifically the strategic approach to insurance. I am Trevor Helmstead. Um, I work as a financial advisor here at Telemus. We work with individuals and families with the, to help achieve their goals. Um, previously to working at Telemus, I worked as a bank, bank portfolio manager, working with a similar client set, and uh, also had spent some time on a fixed income trading desk working as a fixed income strategist at a local bank in the area. With me today, I've got Ari Fishman, who is our in-house guru for all things insurance. Um, Ari, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Ari Fishman. I'm a certified financial planner with a focus and concentration on all things insurance, as Trevor said. I've been in practice now for 18 years and over the past five years as a strategic partner with Telemus. Great. Thanks, Ari. Uh, I'll go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, really, insurance is a very important piece to a larger, uh, larger puzzle, which is something that we try to uh, work with clients and solve on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's an important component to the financial planning piece. Um, one thing that we do here, it's, it's a core of what we do, financial planning. It, it involves asking a lot of questions. We're going to talk about questions today. Uh, and also, it, it involves problem solving. The problem solving piece is one of the, the aspects I enjoy most as my advisor role. Um, because in the planning process, we're trying to create a blueprint to live out our financial lives. Uh, tell us we, we hear a lot of words, uh, the name holistic approach. It's, it's important on how we approach the problem solving and planning process. We look at a number of different touch points uh, to create a plan so we can effectively use our resources now and in the future, which really helps clients focus on what they enjoy in living their lives. So as we're thinking about the financial planning process, we, we kind of look at it systematically and there are a number of questions that we start to ask as we back and fill uh, parts of that puzzle. Um, typically, we start out really just looking at a cash flow and, and determining a budget. Um, how much are we spending? How much are, are we saving? Are we Create, creating good financial money behaviors now that are going to get our, our short-term goals, such as buying a house, and are we going to, you know, be able to live out retirement um, in a, an extended period of time on a fixed income? We also look at uh, investments and risk management within our investment portfolio. Uh, do we have the right investment mix? Do we have too much risk in our portfolio? Are we unable to sleep at night because of the volatility that we've seen at times here in the stock market? We also need to know are we taking enough risk because, if, you know, we think about the picture of once we reach retirement and we're, we're relying on the nest egg that we've created to live on, we need to make sure that we get, we get to a level that we're going to be able to live off our assets for a number of years in retirement. We also look at debt when we're creating a financial plan. How effectively are we using debt? Um, are, should we even have debt? Um, are we addressing debt possibly like student loans? Do we have a plan to, a plan to pay those down? Um, we're also in kind of a unique environment now with rates at near historic lows. Um, we have the opportunity to refinance. Are we, you know, do we have good rates on our mortgages? Um, those are some of the things that we look at if we're borrowing efficiently. We also like to involve a larger team outside of Telmas and have specialists um, that take part in the planning process. So we want to know is your CPA involved? Uh, within managing the investment portfolio, are we are we managing it in a tax efficient man manner? Are we looking at municipal bonds in a taxable account, or we harvesting losses in a taxable account to offset gains. Things like that are going to allow to have us to have incremental savings that will build up over time. Also, the estate planning piece is an incredibly important piece of financial planning. Is, it, is your estate planning attorney involved? Uh, and are the proper documentation uh, documents in place? Is there a will, a, li a living trust, a durable power of attorney, and an advanced health care directive? All very important pieces which also brings us to the topic today, which is insurance planning. Some of the questions we hope to look at, do we have the right insurance? Are we paying too much? Are we effectively insured? And who are our beneficiaries? Uh, so with that, I'll see up Ari to take over and look at uh, some of the problems with inefficient insurance. Thank you, Trevor. In my experience, after we gather all the information that's necessary, uh, the various insurance products that clients have purchased for years, it becomes clear that most of the policies were sold without a thorough evaluation of their overall financial plan. So when we get involved, we first work on consolidating and summarizing everything that the client has purchased uh, over the years, the insurance product. And then we discuss with the financial life advisor what solutions make sense in accordance to their financial plan, not necessarily the reason they bought their products at any given time. So. When, when we do that, we've come to the conclusion that now, as we get involved, 
over 70% of the clients that we're reviewing coverage for, we have found that their insurance is in need of some sort of tune-up, and sometimes a desperate one. We find these clients are overinsured, underinsured, and insured, in, insured ineffectively and inefficiently. And we sometimes can make quick fixes to big ticket items that protect their uh, biggest liabilities. You know, when we're working on building wealth and we've accumulated wealth, if we don't protect your major assets in, a mo in, a, in an effective way, um, something, some ca something catastrophic could really tear everything apart. So we're looking right away at a, over to big ticket items. Do you have umbrella coverages? Do you, are you have um, underinsured or uninsured riders on your, on your auto policies? Uh, and then the commonly used coverages, such as water backup or mold. We know from Huntington Woods in, uh, in Michigan here, that was a big issue. So we're looking at the items that get used all the time, and then the items that are big ticket items as far as from a liability perspective to uh, create that. And then on the, uh, the life insurance, it's a category of itself. Um, on the life insurance, we find that there's a lot of transactions that are, are purchased over the years. And, um, and a lot of times they were done for different reasons at given times. So uh, a lot of times when someone's young, they're buying term insurance. And uh, over the years, they, they buy another term insurance when they could have consolidated to have a cheaper, bigger policy at some time. So there's a lot of different reasons that they buy policies. And most of the times it comes in press that they're messed up. So we're going to look at a, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good lead in Ari. Um, you know, I, in terms of my background, insurance is something I actually just recently got licensed in the last six months, but in six months of, of working here, I've we've had the chance to get some exposure to some really incredible cases where we're, we're presenting a tremendous value add for clients and uh, either, you know, getting people out of in a, junky insurance that isn't, isn't, written how it was intended or helping them save a lot of money. So um, I know that you've recently worked on a case uh, that, that close and um, we've changed the names, but I think this is kind of a helpful example to kind of walk through and see, you know, how someone came to us with a certain set in, uh, of insurance and we help kind of tidy things up and, and improve uh, the outcome. Absolutely. Thanks, Trevor. This case is interesting. You see it on your screen. I probably jumped the gun a little bit by showing it a little too soon, but this case is interesting because it addresses a lot of what I just talked about on the on the life insurance side. Uh, we had originally a client who had two contracts in place. They had a policy with two and a half million dollar term policy with 10 years remaining, and they were paying $5,000 a year. And then they had a more traditional whole life policy from Northwestern Mutual that they're paying $16,000 a year. So they were paying $21,000 a year. Um, the term policy was owned personally, and this client happened to also have an estate tax liability. So uh, the policies were just not owned correctly, and they were inefficient for what the objectives were. And to the objectives, the, the client's un end game was they didn't want this policy for cash value. They weren't planning on utilizing it. They wanted to maximize coverage within the next 10-year period while the client uh, still had a little bit left in, in their working career and then ultimately leave the rest to their, their kids, to their beneficiaries. So the objective was to get as much coverage um, over, the, over the next 10, 15 years, and then uh, make sure that there was a legacy for their kids and how to maximize it for the same amount they were spending or less. So in this case, we, we looked at within the financial plan, how much coverage that ultimately we wanted to make sure that was in place. And in this case, it was consistent. We wanted to keep $4 million of coverage in place. Uh, but what we were able to do by taking some of the cash value that had built up in, uh, in Jack's Northwestern Mutual policy, we were able to transfer it into a different type of permanent policy and double the death benefit. So we were able to take the one and a half million and transition it to a $3 million policy while saving $3,000 a year in premium. So we went from 16000 to 13000 uh, with double the permanent coverage. And then on the term insurance, we were able to get a 15-year term, just a million, because we, we got more permanent insurance now, so we didn't need as much term. And the cost was $2,300 a year compared to what they were spending before, the 5000 on term insurance. The, the end goal, the end result here from the, just Jack's policies 
is that he had a new premium of fifteen thousand three hundred, and um, at, compared to twenty one thousand, so they saved five thousand seven hundred, or or in other words, twenty five percent, and ultimately had doubled the permanent coverage and longer term on the remaining one million of term insurance. Um, at the same time, we were able to, fix, able to fix some ownership and beneficiary problems. Uh, we were able to get the, the term insurance out of the estate. Um, the North, Northwestern Mutual is already out of the state, so on the, on the new permanent policy, we were able to keep that out of the state. And then on um, Karen's life, the coverage was, was fine. It was, it was reasonably priced. It was a good value. Uh, so we, we kept that in place, but we were able to update the ownership and beneficiaries uh, to meet their estate planning objectives. So it was a fun case because we were able to do a lot more for the existing premium dollars while saving the money at the same time. This couple, we also were able to fix some some things with their property and casualty insurance as well, uh, but we didn't want to overwhelm the, the information on, on one case. So I really like this example because it really just shows how you know, you've been able to improve the situation. You may have not known when, when Jack and Karen originally purchased their insurance, what their intention was, you know, fast forward in time, is it still the appropriate amount of coverage? The one thing that kind of sticks out to me that I think is interesting, and it's with your setup and the incredible amount of industry contacts you have, you know, people come to us with all sorts of insurance. They've got Genworth, they've got MetLife. You know, you have the ability to go out and shop and look at Lincoln Financial, the John Hancock, and there are even some, you know, some interesting bells and whistles. So those policies we're, we're not going to mention just right now. But you, you can really take a look at everything out there and then make a completely objective call on what's, what's the best way to go. Yeah, Trevor, one of the incredible things about doing what we do here is um, by partnering with Telemis, more times than not, we're not just going in and meeting with clients and looking to offer them new coverage. More times than not, we're evaluating what they have in place already. Uh, so we're reviewing uh, a, a tremendous amount of existing enforce contracts and learning them, uh, uh, we're getting incredible exposure to what's out in the industry, what are other advisors presenting, what are the good ideas, what are the bad ideas, what are the, the red flags, where, where are advisors over-promising, which ones are the transaction-based advisors, which ones are the um, financial planning and holistic-based advisors. And uh, we're able to take all the, the broad range of experiences that we're getting and, uh, and and just see a lot so we can bring the best and brightest ideas to, to the Telemus uh, family of clients. I would say there's never a shortage of bright ideas here, especially when it comes to the insurance <laughs> angle. So um, maybe if we just shift and we looked at uh, how advisors are working with their clients, what kind of the questions would you expect and how would it work as we're starting off the insurance audit process? So the insurance audit process, more times than not, comes uh, as a follow-up to the overall financial planning process. So. Once we have a great idea of, of what their financial life plan is and what their overall objectives are for, uh, for themselves and their, their kids or charities, uh, it helps us understand as far as what should be in place. Uh, but the first thing that we're looking at is trying to get clients to, uh, to agree to allow us to review everything in place. And in order to do that, we need to get signed or enforced authorization forms for us to do an audit on the, the life insurance policies. And then on the property and casualty insurance policies, we need to obtain declaration pages um, and, and to see where, where they are. And we evaluate that as far as when we're looking at total coverages, what their assets are and net worth to make sure that they're protected in accordance to the, the, where they should be from an efficiency perspective. Um, and then we're looking at when we consolidate and gather all the information in hand, uh, we, we look at it and, and see if what they have makes sense, if anything should be tweaked with the existing contract, if any um, updates from a planning perspective should be made, um, and or if there's inefficiencies where policies are overpriced or, uh, or someone's um, uninsured or overinsured where we could fix that in a, in a relatively seamless manner. So and I think also with the, the whole planning process, it's not necessarily a one and done where someone's coming in for a one-off insurance review and then that's it. There's gonna be multiple follow-ups, there's there's deep analysis, you know, we're taking a look at a lot of different angles. We're understanding the needs and wants of the client. Uh, and, and and I've seen as as I've worked on some of these cases with ERA, I mean there's multiple follow-ups. It's not just a simple initial meeting. Um, I think you know, as as someone's getting maybe ready for that initial meeting with their advisor or if someone isn't currently talking with their advisor about life insurance, what are some of the, the questions or maybe 
you know, the easy, easy, uh, low hanging fruit to take a, to take a stab at, uh, when we're approaching the review process. Great. Um, so some of the, the low hanging fruit that we're looking at from it are, are clearly right out of the gate, uh, ownership and beneficiary issues. I can't tell you how many times I've seen um, someone who's gotten divorced, and sometimes the settlement requires them to have uh, them, uh, the ex-spouse as a beneficiary for a period of time, but many times that doesn't get updated. So they have their ex-spouses as the beneficiary when really it should be some sort of trust for the benefit of their kids. Um, we've seen deceased beneficiaries, uh, which is a major red flag, obviously. It could cause uh, some... Um, some contesting, uh, just a whole bunch of estate planning pro uh, problems later on. Um, we've seen trusts that get updated uh, with uh, uh, with their estate planning attorney, but never funded with the insurance, where they never come back to the insurance advisor and make sure that the policies that are in place or that should be in place to work with the trust uh, get implemented. Those are some of the things on, on life insurance that, that just um, I, I would say make sure that you're looking at it. Every time you do update your estate planning documents, you definitely would want to make sure of it, that you're revisiting your all your life insurance contracts. Uh, another big one is whole life or universal life insurance. Uh, universal life insurance is something that um, the newer contracts generally are priced a lot more, um, are, are a lot more affordable than the older con contracts. And um, in a sense, it's kind of like the mortgage market. You could refinance your universal life policies. You could go from a older priced model to a more reasonably priced model and get a lot more insurance for the same benefit. Uh, whole life insurance is another one. Um, over the past uh, 10 years, dividend rates have been going down dramatically uh, because of the low interest rate environment. Some insurance companies much more so than the others. So it's very important to get enforced illustrations to see how those whole lives are performing. And especially if it's for death benefit, many times you could do a lot more for, uh, for money uh, from those older whole life policies into new policies, uh, especially in underperforming. And we've even seen a whole life policies uh, from companies that demutualized and ultimately stopped paying dividends and gave stock instead. Um, as a result, those policies really underperformed going forward. Uh, because a lot of the value was given with the stock, and we're able to get the uh, clients out of those policies and policies that are dramatically better from an uh, Apple to Apple's perspective. Great. Yep. And then on the property and casualty insurance, I just uh, mentioned always everyone, I don't care what your net worth is or your income is, everyone should have some sort of umbrella policy. Uh, umbrella policy, very simply, is going to cover what your auto or, or home doesn't cover. Uh, when I first moved to Michigan almost 15 years ago, I skidded through a stop sign, got into a small accident, and the lady ultimately ended up suing me. And um, when the insurance company told me that I was being sued, the first thing they said, well, don't worry, because worst comes to worst, you, you have an umbrella policy. Uh, so it, it's one of those stop losses in those type of events. Uh, home insurance, you know, water backup, sometimes we see $10,000 limits. Um, everyone should, should, for the most part, have much higher limits on, on that. And then uh, riders such as under and uninsured riders to make sure that you're protected as well. But overall, I mean, there's a lot of components to all things insurance. So having a comprehensive insurance audit is a wise decision. So good questions, Ari, and thanks. I, I find it's interesting when you kind of offer up a, a personal example. I, I remember, too, it really came up from... Uh, conversation I was having with someone at work to talk about the water policy, the water backup. And that was just shortly before we had, um, in Michigan, we had the 100-year flood, which nailed a lot of the area here with, uh, with sewer backups. And um, because I had that policy in place, it made the whole process uh, a lot less painful to, to get through. But um, yeah, I think what we hope to accomplish, we wanted to kind of give a brief overview of insurance and the planning process and kind of see how that fits into a, you know, good a well thought out financial plan. Um, we've got experts here. Ari is available. You know, you can email him if you're working with an advisor at Telemus. Uh, pick up the phone, give us a call um, to talk about um, any one of these questions that may may have you know perked your perked your interest. Um, we have some time left. I think we're going to open it up. If we had some questions, we could uh, address those now. Uh, yep, we have uh, 
two questions right now, and if anyone has any additional questions, they can type them into the questions box. Um, first question is, what are some of the unique cases you've seen in the past 12 months? Oh, wow. <clears throat> That's a great one. Um, thanks, for, thanks for the question. There, there's been a lot of uh, interesting cases that we've gotten to work on over the past year. Uh, I'll tell you one thing in particular that, that seems to be just getting a lot of attention is uh, our clients have a lot of money in IRAs. And what we're finding is, is that uh, with, with currently the elections going on, uh, we have a, a trillion dollar deficits and current tax rates are at historic lows. So uh, we view the, those, uh, that IRA money as their most expensive asset in a sense because every penny on the way out is going to get taxed at ordinary income tax rates. So if uh, tax rates increase, it becomes a more and more uh, inefficient asset over time. So we've been thinking about strategies, especially with the SECURE Act, which is going to, which makes it a worse asset to inherit as well. There's no longer stretch IRA provisions yet. Someone who inherits an IRA has to ultimately get rid of the, spend down that asset within 10 years from inheriting it. So um, some of those provisions have changed. So what we've been doing is thinking about strategies of how we could effectively um, reposition those IRA monies into more tax efficient assets, whether it be for wealth transfer uh, to one's heirs or to organizations, or even spend it, um, use the values in retirement uh, in a more tax efficient manner. So we've all known about the Roth conversions, but lately uh, we've been using life insurance as a uh, strategy to reposition those IRA monies. And one, this strategy entails uh, spending down the IRA into an insurance policy, then the following year taking out a, the cash value for the tax, a, a piece of what you've spent into the premiums uh, from the cash value to cover the tax that you would have had to spend. Um, and then over a five to 10 year period, the IRA is completely spent down into a fully funded cash value based insurance policy. And the net result for someone who's 60 years old, which is the case that we recently did, is more than double the projected net after tax return that they could pull out if they want to use for their own retirement interest um, after taxes, how much money they could pull out of the policy while still leaving substantial amounts to their loved ones. So in this example, we used $500,000 in an IRA. Um, the person had more qualified money, but we just used this $500,000 bucket. And we were ultimately able to pull out projected uh, over a million dollars tax-free while leaving a million dollars to their beneficiaries when they passed out. At least that's what the projected returns are. So taking a 500K IRA that as it grows, it's gonna to continue to compound the tax liability to being able to get out two million by the time he, he the person would pass away tax free. It's cool stuff. It could be a webinar in itself. So sorry if I didn't do it justice, uh, but it's a lot of fun and it's getting a lot of interest. And we're in the middle of creating a piece on it actually as we speak. Um, another question: um, How do you determine how much of an umbrella po umbrella policy is needed? So that's another good question. Um, really, the 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 first it's it's. Typically, we are matching net worth um, up to a certain limit till we start drawing back. But at first, the first three million, we're matching net worth, and then typically we're go scaling back to closer to 50% uh, uh, over the next several million, and then 25% over the next several, several million. So, for example, uh, someone who's worth uh, five million, uh, we may look at a three or four million dollar uh, umbrella policy. Um, Someone who's worth 10 million, we may look at a $5 million umbrella policy. So we start scaling back with, with net worth, uh, but we, we, we'd like to match for sure the first 3 million. Okay, uh, another one. What are some of the interesting cases you're working on for 2020? Another great question. Uh, so right now, the, the interest rate market is incredibly low and the uh, it's projected to stay that way for a while. Uh, and some cash value insurance policies are crediting higher rates than what the interest rate that you can borrow from. So younger people could actually borrow substantial amounts of money, collateralize it against the insurance policy um, with putting little or no money into the contract and, um, and, and ultimately have create substantial amounts of wealth through these uh, finance policies. 
And the biggest concern over the years, if, if anyone's ever seen premium finance life insurance, is, is interest rate risk. What happens if interest rates rise and you're borrowing money to fund the policy? Uh, so we're in the middle of developing a strategy which hedges those risks um, for pennies on the dollar. Uh, so it's it's by we're we're formulating that idea, and um, ultimately, if interest rates rise uh, with with our hedging strategy, you could actually make a lot of money to pay down the debt on the interest rate, which is much cheaper than uh, buying rate locks and things of that nature that people have done in the past. So we're creating strategies for people that are young that they could create. Uh, uh, tax-free uh, retirement income, but just by using their their credit worthiness. And then people that are, um, you know, I would say 60 and older uh, for legacy planning, it, it becomes a phenomenal tool. And you know, it's interesting, we just recently uh, had some cases where um, we're looking at if someone has a, has done really well with their money, uh, whether it be in, in their various businesses or real estate, um, what we've found is, is that through this strategy, uh, they're able to take a lot of risk out of their core businesses for wealth transfer planning and diversify it within a, a more predictable asset class with comfortable uh, interest rates that we could also control the risk from by, the, by this uh, hedging strategy. So it's a lot of fun. We're, we're uh, simplifying it and building on that idea as well. Um, but I think in this low interest rate environment where uh, LIBOR is expected to only get better over time in terms of uh, there's ways of capitalizing on it uh, and, and create a lot of meaningful wealth for organizations, families, and um, and our clients. If I can just add, I, it, it is really fascinating stuff. That, um, it's a little, it sounds a little complicated. I think it could be maybe, uh, Matt, even a teaser for a follow-up uh, webinar. I, I know that we've got a really strong showing today. Um, but it's something interesting, premium finance, if you're not talking to someone about it, uh, we've got a number of cases here we're helping clients with, uh, and I think it's a, it's a tremendous value add uh, to, you know, again, work through that, that piece of the financial planning process. Great. Um, that's all the questions we have for today. Um, we are recording this, so if anyone wants to go back and hear about anything, you can reach out to Trevor and Ari directly, or the recording will be uh, online shortly. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending.